Hey ladies, I hope that you guys are all doing well. This is a different type of adventure for us all. We're gonna be doing this online and then um, we're gonna be meeting up on Zoom after this. So I hope that the Lord just blesses our conversation. Um, I felt that it was very important to finish this study because we have gone all the way through John and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for the call of the Lord to be upon us at the end of this chapter and in the circumstances that are surrounding us with COVID-19 and the grocery store is empty and all of these things that are happening, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to just stop with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It, it makes sense to continue on to see what the calling, what was the purpose, what are we to do now that he is risen? And so I really wanted to finish up this chapter. So we've taken a few weeks break and, um, I want to jump back into it tonight with you guys and really just unpack what the Lord has commanded us to do and what he commanded Peter to do and what he's commanding us to do in the times that we're facing now. So I'm going to pray and then we're going to jump right in. Um, Lord, all of the chaos, all of the storm that rages around us, I ask that you would bring peace and joy and comfort to all of the fear, all of the sorrow all of the pain that is surrounding us. And I ask that you would speak joy and peace over the storm, that you would bring healing to those who need it, that you would protect those who might succumb to this illness. And Lord, I just ask that salvation would come to many because of this storm, that you would remind people who you are and that your people would rise to the occasion and follow out the calling that you have placed upon each of us. In your name we pray, amen. So, um, we're just going to jump right in. So if you want to go ahead and turn to John chapter 21, we're going to be looking at the very first part of this and I'm going to kind of do a cap. So last week, Jesus has risen from the dead. All the disciples are now aware. They have laid eyes on him. Some of them have placed their hands upon his hands and his, scar his scars. And so now they are very aware that their Jesus, the one who has been crucified, is now alive and well by the power of his own name. And so now he has risen from the grave. And now we need to look at what is it that the disciples are to do with this information? What is it that they are supposed to do now that Christ is risen. They, they know that he's given them several commands, and now it's time for them to walk it out. So at the beginning of this chapter, you're going to see that Peter, and he wants to go fishing. So he grabs up and he says, I'm going fishing. And there's a reason. Maybe he's bored. Maybe he just doesn't know what else to do. Maybe he's killing the time waiting because Jesus has told them that he's, they're supposed to wait for him. And so maybe he's just killing time. We don't know the reason, but there is something very symbolic so in Matthew chapter 16, 18, it says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we know that Peter, according to Matthew chapter 16 and earlier on in John, that he has a specific calling on his life. We also know that Peter, in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 19, it says, While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So Peter is returning to the work that he has done prior to being called in the first place by Jesus to follow him. And so Jesus has told him, I am going to make you fishers of men. But Peter returns to the sea, and he is fishing for fish fish. And so I want you to keep that in mind. So all night long, several of the disciples join Peter and nothing. They don't catch a single fish. And so Jesus, whom they don't recognize, shows up on the edge of the sea and he says, hey, take your nets and cast them into the other side. So that w as soon as they do this, which why would you do this? But they did it. They, they obeyed. They'd seen tons of miraculous signs. They'd seen all kinds of things. So maybe they were at the end of their rope. We don't know why they chose to do it and obey immediately, but they did. So they cast their net into the other side. And sure enough, the nets begin to fill with fish, 153 fish, which is a great number of fish. We don't know the fullness of the symbolic number, whatever that is, but we know that it was a number of greatness. And so they're pulling in the nets and John immediately says, Peter, 
this is the Lord. And so Peter, he wraps his cloak around him and he jumps into the sea is what we're told. And he rushes to the edge of the lake where he can be with Jesus. He loves Jesus. Remember this. He loves him. So he rushes into the water and out onto the shore. And whenever the other disciples arrive, they are Jesus is serving them. He has a coal fire set up with some fish and some bread. And so it's important to recognize that Jesus served them by washing their feet before his death and resurrection. And now that he has raised, been raised from the dead, he is still actively pursuing and ministering to his disciples. And so he is actively participating in their lives, and he is actively participating in our lives. He never has abandoned us. He will continue to minister to us as we go about our calling. So tonight, we are going to look at the cost to follow Christ. There is a cost, and there are two things that the Lord commands Peter to do, and we're going to see how that applies to us as well. Our purpose tonight is to remind us of the calling that the Lord has given us, the purpose in which we serve Him and follow Him. So if you turn to John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19, it says, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, 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 I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. So Jesus asked Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And so Peter, he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus tells him, feed my lambs. When Jesus is asking, do you love me in this text, he's using words together that imply, are you completely committed to me? When Peter responds, he doesn't respond with the same word love that Jesus has just asked him. He responds in a way that says, yeah, I love you, but it lacks that full commitment that Jesus has just asked for. Peter has proclaimed his love for Jesus. We've seen this all throughout the gospel. And he's done it with the most force. Out of all of the disciples, he's the one who said, I will not abandon you. Even if it costs my life, I will not abandon you. But he is the one who cuts off the ear of the guard whenever they come to arrest Jesus. He's the one who wants to build him a house whenever he sees him with Moses. He's the one who's constantly thinking and he's a doer. He's a checklist guy. And we've talked about that a little bit. So he's the one who enters the courtyard with one other disciple. Think about it. Whenever all of the disciples disperse when Jesus is arrested, John and Peter are the ones who follow to the courtyard to see the proceedings. But it is here that Peter fails. He fails to keep his word. He spares his own life by denying the Lord, not once, not twice, but three times fulfilling the words that Jesus had spoken to him in John chapter 15 or 16, sorry. Now Christ is risen and he wants to know, do you love me more than these? And so Peter had to have felt a little bit crushed by this, okay? He was hesitant to make such a claim to the Lord because he was aware of his failure to live out those words. See, before Christ died, he was very adamant. I will follow you. I do love you. I love you to this extent. And yet he had failed to fulfill his own words. And so at this point, we see this hesitant Peter where he's going, 
I don't know if I love you. Like, I love you. I do. But what if I mess up again? What if I fail again? And so he says, yes, yes, I love you. But it lacks commitment. And what does Jesus say to him? He says, feed my lambs. Lambs are young. They're vulnerable. They are weak. And they have no hope of survival without a strong shepherd to lead them. So Jesus wants Peter to lead as his under shepherd, but he must have an overwhelming drive and a complete devotion, complete commitment to Christ in order to carry this out. So you and I, if we desire, we need to follow this. We need to take what Jesus says here. And you and I have to understand that if we want to complete the Lord's tasks that he has given us, if we want to live for him, if we want to do great things, little things, whatever it is that he's called you to, you and I have to be 100% sold out. We have to love him with everything in us. There is no partial, I'll work it out later. Well, I love this part of my sin, so I'm going to keep on to holding on to that. It is we are totally sold out. We are completely in surrender to the Almighty because we love him, okay? So it says, feed my lambs. This was true for Peter, but it is true for you and I. Every messenger, every believer, every follower of Christ must teach the word of God. That is the bread of life. That is what we have talked about. We are to proclaim his truth among the nations, among our homes, with our spouse, with our children, with our friends, with the cashier. We are called to have the gospel on our lips and to be the messengers of that gospel. And if we are not 100% sold out for Christ, if we are not 100% committed, we will never, ever do it. There are many times that we come in contact with others and we just wish, oh, I, I, and I'm guilty of it too. Every single one of us are. We have passed up those opportunities to share the gospel. We have to assess our lives and understand that there are things that re, remove us and hold us back from being committed fully committed and we need to repent when we are not fully committed to the gospel. We've got to repent and turn back to the Lord so that he can embolden us by the power of his Holy Spirit to proclaim his good news so that we might see lives saved. The point two, Jesus asked Simon, son of John, do you love me? Again, for the second time, Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus responds, tend my sheep. See, Jesus repeats the question a second time using the same words of commitment, the word for devotion and commitment. And Peter then replies in the same way, not with a love of commitment, but I love you. And so it's lacking in that full-blown, all-or-nothing commitment. And again, it's not because Peter doesn't love him. It's because There's some hesitation here. The Lord intensifies his original command. Tend my sheep. Peter was not only called to teach the truth of God's word. He was also called to take care of the sheep. We are to meet the needs, to tend to those around us. You can teach God's word all day long, but the sheep will close their ears to you if you if they do not feel loved by you, if you are not tending to them, if you are not loving them, if there are practical ways that you can love somebody and meet a need, I encourage you, please do that. We see all through the gospels that Jesus meets the physical needs of people before he meets the spiritual needs of people. And so I think we're supposed to do the same. We need to live out our lives where we are in service and loving other people well. So there's lots of practical ways we can do this. Right now, all around you, there are people consumed in fear. You can bring comfort through God's word. You can pray. You can sit and 
talk to somebody through a phone or through Facebook and encourage them. There are men losing their jobs, women losing their jobs. You can go to a grocery store right now and you can see the devastation, the frustration, the anxiety that is consuming our society right now. And so if there is a need, tend to that need and then share God's word with them. Love them well so that you might have a voice and they might hear the words that you have to say. Feed the lambs and tend the sheep. The gist is that you love Jesus by loving his sheep well. You love Jesus by loving his people. And then Jesus, once again, he says, Son of John, do you love me? Peter is grieved. Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. And he follows it by this. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. After all of this, Jesus asks the same question a third time. But there is something interesting about this third time. Jesus no longer is using that word love that means fully committed. He is now using the same word that Peter responds with in the first two questions. He is now using a love. It explains why Peter is grieved. Even the level of love that he thought would be safe is now in question by the Lord. I've asked you twice, are you fully committed? And you've responded with, I love you. And so now Jesus is asking a third time, but he's saying it in a different way. So Peter now reminds the Lord that he knows everything. He kind of surrenders at this point, like, I don't know what else to say. Remember, this is also, Peter denied Christ three times. And it is three times that Jesus asks him, do you love me? Had to be grieving to Peter, right? Had to be. And he says, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. He is not sure how to respond, but he knows one thing. Jesus knows all. He knows the heart and the condition of a man's heart. He knows the depth to which Peter will walk out this love. That love will lead Peter to a life of sacrifice, trials, tribulation, and persecution. Ultimately, it would lead to a death by crucifixion. But Peter would refuse to be crucified as his Lord was. He insisted at his own death that he be hung upside down on that cross. To be completely committed to Christ is to know that you will suffer. You may even lay down your life, but it is for great joy to make Christ known. Your reward will be the many that will receive salvation because you proclaimed the gospel to his lambs. You were faithful to tend to his sheep and you followed him even unto death. There is no greater joy than this. There is no greater joy than to serve him. Our friend Peter writes this. I want you to turn to 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19. I'm going to read it to you guys. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. 
However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is a time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Peter found it joyful. He found it to be amazing to suffer for Christ. Every opportunity that he had where he was condemned or persecuted or beaten for the name of Jesus, he counted it joy. And as should we. And if you do not know the Lord, if you do not know who this is that died and rose again, the Son of God, the only Son of God who lived a completely sinless life, who laid down his life for your sin. He paid the full price of every sin that you have ever committed against his father. He laid his down, life down for that, for you. I ask and I would urge you to repent of your sins, to call upon his name and be saved, to ask him to save you. And if you serve him, I encourage you, take heart. This is a dark and devastating time for the people around you. But this is not a time to be overcome with fear and resentment and rage and frustration. This is a time to put our hands to the plow. This is a time to live out the calling that God has placed upon you, to be bold with the gospel, to be a messenger of his, his heart to his people. Feed his lambs, tend to his sheep, and follow him. I'm going to go ahead and pray. Lord, I just ask, I thank you for those who will be saved because of your words, because of your glory. I ask for mercy upon every sinner. Lord, that you would draw them to repentance, that you would draw the ungodly and the sinner to yourself, and that you would save many. Lord, I ask that your will would be done in our nation, in the world. Lord, that you would draw many souls to yourself. Lord, I ask as your believers, that you would humble us, that you would allow us to fully rely on you in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of suffering, that you would be glorified among your people, that we would raise up a shout of praise and a shout of joy because you are our king and there is no weapon that forms against us that can prosper because you have protected us. You have given us eternal life through your sacrifice. I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I love all of you guys. Continue to pray. Continue to worship. Continue to stir your affections for this, for your Lord, for your Savior. And then share the hope that you have with the world. Love you, girls.